Welcome everybody to Theory Underground. This segment is from an epic marathon live stream at Theory Underground. These are something that happens every one to three months at Theory Underground. It's where I have a whole bunch of different guests who are significant figures in the theory scene today on for a conversation about something related to the subject matters that are most relevant to the kind of research going on at Theory Underground. If you're never ever able to follow along for one of these entire live streams, uh, don't worry about it because I always post the segments like this one after the fact. But also, if you are the kind of worker who works all day long and is interested in long form content, then these streams really might be for you. That's the kind of person I have in mind when making this content, right? Because I work at Amazon, I'm listening to stuff. I like, I like to listen to long form theory related content. Not everybody is able to keep up with such stuff though, which is why I post these as standalone videos. I guess the last thing I want to say before turning it over though, is if you like this kind of content, if you're interested in the kinds of guests that I'm bringing on, the kind of research going on at Theory Underground, or if you're interested in any of the lecture courses, then you're going to want to like, comment, and subscribe. Liking, commenting, and subscribing is how you train the algorithm to feed you something a little bit better than what might be the default diet it is feeding you. If you were liking and commenting and subscribing a lot back in the day, and nowadays you don't do it as often, chances are the algorithms have not adapted to your new tastes, your evolved palate. And so yes, if you are into theory, if you are into philosophy, if you think we don't know what's going on today, if you don't really see hope in anything that is currently on offer, then Theory Underground is ground zero for the kind of research questions and concepts, thinkers, texts necessary for getting to the bottom of what we are actually dealing with today. So yes, Theory Underground is all about trying to figure out the situation. And these guests from our Epic Marathon live streams are part of that puzzle. So like, comment, subscribe, check out the Patreon. Thank you. Enjoy this interview. Welcome, Alenka Zut Ponchit. How are you doing today? Um, great to be here. I'm very happy to have this opportunity and to yeah be able to do, to discuss things uh, at this platform at this site. So I'm I'm okay. It's like early afternoon here, so I guess for some people it's very very early morning. Um, I appreciate <laughs> whatever the eagerness to listen to this discussion even so early in the morning. Oh yeah, we've got a lot of people who you know. I'm I'm hoping that this gives them their sort of morning kick along with their coffee as they get into their their job or whatever. This is the first time that we've or the kind sorry kick or the kind of depression after which everything will look great <laughs> when they come to work. <laughs> Much more interesting and funny. <laughs> Sorry, I'm joking. No, well, yeah, it is. It you know, it is kind of like a form of uh, disassociation to be able to you know, if you sneak an earbud at work, some people are allowed to have an an earbud at work. You know, excuse me, but like th some people are allowed to have their earbud or their headphones, but uh, a lot of the time you actually have to sneak it. It's a uh, it's it's a form of inherent transgression to be able to listen to. Uh, to lectures and interviews and books while you're working. And so um, to all of the workers out there who are, uh, who are doing that, you know, uh, rock on. It, 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 but it's, it's like a form of disassociation because, you know, your, your body is at work, your body is growing tired, or, but, but your mind is somewhere else, you know. This is the first time that we've had Alenka since uh, she was published in Underground Theory. Um, her piece in Underground Theory is called Is Sex Passé? And so I thought maybe we could start with um, some questions related to that piece. But first, I also kind of want to introduce you uh, to the new listener, to people who might not be super familiar with your work. And I'll just say as a way of introduction, that Oleka Zupancic is part of what is called, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, the Ljubljana School in Slovenia. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Correct. Wonderful. Which, you know, obviously 
uh, Slavoj Žižek is a part of. He tends to take the spotlight, but as he l- will freely admit and r- routinely says, like he owes everything to his fellow travelers in the Ljubljana school. And Aleka's work is spanning a wide array of topics. Uh, most recently, you published Let Them Rot, Antigone's Parallax. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And then, like, I don't know, I think probably a long time ago. There, there is just recently, sorry, there is a um, European edition of this book which just came out in December. Because it was, it seems it was very hard to get in Europe. So there is a European version now with a, a both face. <laughs> so there's a, and it's just um, Let Them Rot without the subtitle. Oh, no subtitle. Okay. So Let Them Rot. And I had actually originally, I think in our email correspondence, had it backwards. I, uh, I, th- I thought it was Antigone's Parallax, Let Them Rot. No, it's Let Them Rot is the, is the main thing. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but you know, you you've written books on dealing with Nietzsche. You've written books dealing on uh, and and uh, inter, uh, interpreting Antigone. Um, but I think that the the work we'll be focusing on is this this work you've done on sex. But I guess I want to allow you to kind of say a few things by way of introduction, and I will just kind of set you up by saying, you know, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you got into um, Lacan. Hegel, theory more broadly, kind of what was your way into this world? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, as it, it usually happens, uh, this is always a kind of interplay of uh, some things that are there and some coincidences, just like uh, shit happens, good things happen, and uh, uh, I kind of, uh, the fact is that when I was coming of the age of reason, as that is said in 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 French, uh, when I was in high school, the 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 slu- the scene here in Ljubljana uh, was just really really changing a lot, and uh, coming to this kind of a life that you know now in these terms of Slovene, whatever Ljubljana school uh, theoretical, I mean. Um, Things were happening. Slavoj and a few others, which are a bit older than me, were already on the scene, and books were published that were completely out of the ordinary. Uh, not only in comparison to whatever uh, the classical let's say, regime books that were available then, but uh, I think um, out of ordinary. Just a moment. There is this uh, surplus sun coming. <laughs> Surplus sun blasting in, going. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. The ghost of Bataille. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so there was this kind of uh, uh, very vibrating scene that was already there. Okay, if one it was interested in it. But so I was in high school and I just came across uh, some books that they published at that point, particularly the Slavoj's book, the. Um, uh, history and the unconscious, which was the Slovene book then, uh, and I was completely swept <laughs> off my foot uh, because it was something so interesting and so different from anything that I read before and, or thought people were reading before, even my parents, my father was some kind of a intellectual. I mean, this was so new, different, and my question was simply, okay, what did the, what did these people study, what did their line of whatever interest, okay, philosophy. So uh, from that moment on, uh, and yeah, as I said, it happened relatively early in high school, it was uh, decided for me. So, um, a- and I then soon joined this group uh, and was very uh, warmly welcomed uh, in their middle. Uh, but yeah, I happened to read a couple of books that uh, kind of uh, well, this was my whatever uh, encounter with something that, uh, yeah, then really shifted and changed and orientated my life so, so, and it still does. So, well, here are a couple of those books that had the most, you know, this this impact on you. So I said one was this uh, book by Slavoj Žižek, History and the Unconscious, which does not exist under this title in 
the English translation, but I think the crucial parts and bits of it uh, are in other early books of Slavoj that he published, uh, um, uh, like from Sublime Objects, the stuff like this. So, uh, but uh, the Slovene title was this is just an English translation, History and the Unconscious, and this kind of reading of Marx that was completely different from the Marx that we were officially served in uh, then still uh, ex Yugoslavia. Uh, and also the introduction of, of Lacan, of this thought, which is uh, also presented right in a new uh, and uh, very interesting way. Uh, so, and then there were also the first translations of Lacan. Uh, the Seminar 11th actually was, I think, the first one translated in Slovene. Uh, so I, 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 as I think you can imagine then, I mean, I was not a particularly whatever, I mean, I was normal. Uh, human being, uh, and this stuff was sometimes extremely uh, difficult. But uh, the say so, I cannot say that. Okay, I read these books, I understood everything, and I just decided that this would be my path. Not at all. I understood almost nothing, <laughs> but there was something, some some things that I understood and understood just enough to be really driven to do some more research and to to try to understand more and to figure out what was going on there. I mean, so it's not like something, oh, that I would read that, say, okay, yes, that's it. I I understand what it is. It's just uh, even that some things, what the, the kind of questions you ask, the kind of topics you uh, abort, which, you, which is not a classic necessarily academic topic, but the kind of twists and further interrogations. So there was something extremely interesting and fascinating that pulled me in, even if I was barely able to follow the, the arguments back then. But I, I feel that is very relatable, not just for myself, but probably for a lot of the listeners. Um, we were talking before going live today about how, uh, you know, I have listeners from all walks of life, from all classes, from all uh, areas of the world, really. I mean, I really all areas. Uh, but there's a lot of people who are joining from Europe or the United States who are, for instance, in, in graduate school, but, or maybe they decided not to go to graduate school and now they're working and now they're tuning in. But I said, that's interesting because I always say that my audience, my intentional audience is workers not some kind of ideal worker, not just some kind of, oh, all workers are the same or, but specifically myself 12 years ago. Like I kind of just imagine myself 12 years ago when I was listening to podcasts, stuff like Joe Rogan, and I was getting into, you know, audiobooks instead of just music because I used to just listen to music at work. And I started switching over to podcasts and then intellectual conversations and then audiobooks. And around that time, uh, I still didn't know what philosophy was, right? And so that's when people tend to go for Sam Harris or, or Richard Dawkins or Neil deGrasse Tyson or uh, Steven Pinker or kind of these, I guess Jordan Peterson also counts now. But these are just kind of these, these pop intellectuals. And so uh, I, I try to make my content for people who maybe got into pop intellectuals, but now they want to start reading real books about more serious philosophy. And the problem with more serious philosophy is really knowing where to start. And so the other day I had someone in the comment section saying that they are new to all of this, but that they're really into it. They just feel overwhelmed and they don't know where to begin. And I think that that's uh, one of the interesting things that you have all kind of pioneered is the idea that there really is no beginning. It's always going to be you're in the deep end and it's always retroactively, um, you know, being made sense of. But I'm curious what you would uh, tell a person who's wondering about where to begin. They look at uh, your work or, or Slavoj's and they, they think, uh, oh my God, do I have to go learn Hegel now? Do I have to, well, then I have to learn Kant. Well, then I have to learn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way back to the pre-Socratics. Um, what do you say to a student who had? Yeah, uh, 
no, I think this is a very good question. I'm not sure that I have in some kind of a um, profound wisdom about it. I can uh, talk, uh, okay, not only from my experience, also from the experience of uh, uh, some of my students, because students are often, even if they are just students and not workers, they're often in a very similar position. They start at the point where they don't uh, yet know things or start reading stuff, which uh, is difficult and so on. So, uh, first of all, I think perhaps just to address the first part of your question, comment, whatever about uh, people first uh, listening to this um, in intellectuals like the, the, the I mean, one thing that for me was always fascinating about someone like, let's say, Zizek, who is a public intellectual and so, but he's a, of a very different kind than these gurus, you know, these intellectual gurus. Uh, and, but I was always fascinated precisely by this twist into his appear, I mean, appearance, not like physical appearance, but in the way he presented things, in the way he was thinking, which was related to the fact that it was not at no point he appeared as the kind of someone who has the wisdom, you know, wisdom to tell now the followers or whatever this is. Uh, but uh, uh so, so, some, someone who is constantly driven by some interrogation of his really who is really driven by going further and asking new and different questions uh every time and kind of undermining the with the next sentence the perhaps some of the things that he said before uh this drive this kind of movement um which is far from any kind of um, uh, wisdom, general wisdom, and like now you will get it, and then you will, it, your life will get easier or better or whatever. The, this kind of things, which I'm kind of uh, suspicious of, uh, was precisely not there. And I think that still now you can really distinguish between uh, some intellectual, public intellectual figures who really believe that they are public intellectual figures and want to. And some who simply are this, and this kind of posture does not enter into the picture. And I, I think, like personally, subjectively, I have a very strong inclination for this um, second kind. So, uh, th so I think for people, be it uh, students or workers or whatever professionals, uh, to enter this kind of uh, thing, uh, you you need for, first to have a certain desire, let's say, for theory, for theory in the largest sense, like philosophy, something that, because not, not all people are particularly, you know, kind of um, um, sensible to this in the sense that there is a strong uh, desire to um, to follow some argument, figure something out, and then also reject it or whatever. So there is a certain, um, doing theory, doing philosophy is a specific thing. It's not that it's not for everybody because of the class differences or whatever, but it's simply not for everybody because not everybody has this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, desire or in the enjoyment in, the, in, in that thing. So this is the first, I would say, necessity. Uh, but then now to finally come to your uh, last question, um, you start to read, I mean, this is, and this is a very Hegelian thing, you always, you don't learn to swim before you jump into the water. So there is no way in which you can say, okay, now I will study this and all this and that, and then I will uh, start doing it. No, you jump in, you start at some point. It very usually, this is a, some random point or point that by some kind of accident or coincidence crosses your life path, whatever, you, you start reading something. And then uh, this kind of intrigues you enough to, to, to pursue, to, to read something more and so on. But this idea that uh, then first, then it leads to France, for instance, from whatever, Lacan or Zizek to, to Hegel or to Kant or to Plato. But this does not mean that you need first to read all of their opuses in order to then be able. It doesn't work like this. You just work as you go along. You read as you go along. You read some Hegel, you read some this. And with this um, difficult classical text, it's always good to read them together with their the, the, the readings of them. Like, uh, not simply, I mean, it's nice to read Hegel, but it's also nice to read, uh, to see also how different uh, philosophers or different interpreters 
see different things and uh, you figure out what is the one approach or the one line that um, speaks to you the most, to the, that kind of your theoretical philosophical machine, uh, that it's your philosophical machine that gets excited about it. Because not all some readings for me also, they can be more or less academically correct, but they are uh, boring or they don't speak to particular paradoxes or things that uh, I'm interested in. But there is no way, I mean, one just needs to go on reading and uh, thinking about things uh, without this idea that there is some some corpus, some totality that once we read all this, then everything will become clear. No, questions will still be there, and this is why this field exists and expands. Uh, otherwise, it would simply stop with Hegel, who was the last probably person in the position to more or less read everything that was uh, around, like uh, in philosophy, but also to some extent in science. Uh, at the time in in uh, in history, then when he was uh, living. Now this is uh, physically impossible. I mean, um, and GPT could, but is it? But uh, yeah, not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, ChatGPT maybe can uh, be be the next ne- next Hegel, but you know. Uh, that's why it's first a tragedy, then as farce, right? My main yep. question that I wanted to uh, kind of frame everything that follows here is um, sort of, I think, potentially the key for unlocking a lot of what you're all doing, um, and especially your work in What is Sex and your piece for Underground Theory is Sex Passe. And that is... The, the concept of drive, its relation to this word sex, which means something very different, I think, in the way that you're using it than how we use it in a standard way in the United States. Um, and then kind of re- something that is potentially related, and that is uh, repression and sublimation. And I kind of want to start start with the latter and then work our way back to, to sex and its relation to drive. You know, are they the same thing? I don't know. Um, and we'll start with, um, so, you know, in, in, a, in the United States, uh, if you go to a psychology class, uh, especially like a psychology 101, uh, they usually give some, at least a little kind of credit to Freud for being a, a founder of the field. Um, and they'll, they'll, you know, you learn about penis envy and what a, what a misogynist he was or, or something along those lines, right? It's very, very simplified. But I remember the thing that I found most impactful was the idea of repression and sublimation. And I remember thinking that makes a lot of sense. Like I, I've always, you know, had the experience of, of we'll say prohibition or, or the, the no of the father or the, 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 the legal system t- t- saying, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, and so of course you're disciplined in, you know, in the society. And so you, you learn to, to not do certain things. Uh, and because you don't do those things, sometimes you feel like you're going to go crazy. Right. And, uh, th- so the idea that we shove all of that down, these impulses, we shove those down, but those continue to live on and then they, those find other ways of manifesting through sublimation, right? That was very intuitive for me. And I really latched onto that as a young uh, learner. And, and I think that that is kind of the way that people talk about repression and sublimation when they're learning about uh, or, or teaching Freud, whether it's on YouTube podcasts or in an actual, you know, class. So with all of that said, I'm curious then, how would you say that Lacan and what y'all do with the Ljubljana school um, takes that and it goes goes in say a different direction? What what changes in in the in your theory when it comes to these ideas of of repression and sublimation, or is it even a change? Yeah, no, I mean this is a huge question, of course, uh, but perhaps a, a simple way to start. Uh, answering is to point out exactly what what Lacan, let's say, did in his return to Freud. 
He simply read Freud. And this, I think, is absolutely crucial because what you mentioned earlier, okay, one uh, hears, hears, hears about Freud more or less dismissively, uh, and then one hears about a couple of uh, whatever doctrines that uh, he's supposed to, uh, theories that he's supposed to advocate, but really this is not Freud. Freud's uh, thought, Freud's investigations, Freud's research, this is something so much alive. I mean, I really, really would strongly encourage people simply to start reading Freud. This is uh, such a vivid, I mean, this was at least my experience, uh, you, and for, with Freud, you don't need many secondary literature and explanation. I think with Freud, it's actually very good to begin with Freud. And uh, because it is also a theory in making, and it is precisely when you reduce it to some ready-made doctrines or theses, then you lose really the, the most important things in it to get it in some way. And so, uh, and he was doing this uh, live with material, with live material, so to say. Uh, so it's really uh, extremely, I don't know, uh, extremely good experience to just try to read Freud and try to read him perhaps precisely without all this um, additional information about this that have, is, has accumulated through this century. Uh, everybody thinks they know what Freud is, but just to try to listen uh, with as little as prejudice as possible to, to read what is going on, and it's exciting to read not only the case histories, which obviously are uh, exciting, it's like almost crime novels, but also these other more uh, conceptual theoretical books. Uh, it's really an exciting thing to read, and there is a thought which is alive. And Lacan's gesture was precisely to get rid of this Institutional, institutionalized Freud, which uh, was also, uh, there were different Freudian orientations, let's say, but different schools, one emphasizing this or the other rather this, but th there was this kind of uh, very, very strong institutionalization of, uh, of Freud, and that was simply that, okay, let's read some Freud. Let's say what, uh, what is alive there, what he does, how he reopens certain questions, why people don't see some other things in it. So, uh, and I think this is precisely what um, is the first important thing to, to simply uh, read Freud. Uh, and then very quickly you get to see how all these notions, uh, starting with repression and sublimation, uh, which are absolutely crucial, but have a much not all, not much more complicated, but I would say much more interesting texture than simply this kind of uh, idea that, okay, there is the society and we enter it as some kind of uh, whatever, uh, innocent or guilty substance and it just tells us what to do, how to do it, represses uh, and uh, causes all this repression which then further operates uh, through many different channels. Uh, so, of course, Freud's idea, it was that civilization, part of civilization was this kind of, uh, no, as you put it, this kind of uh, prohibition as a certain uh, way in which uh, society uh, symbolically organizes uh, its functioning. But it was also his discovery that it's not simply that Without this, let's say, if we can think about some uh, ideal state before the law, let's put it, there was this, uh, some kind of uh, absolute freedom, and then the law, the society came and put an end to this freedom, and now we suffer because of all this repression. Uh, I think what Freud clearly saw is that what you had, I mean, it's not some, if you imagine, some kind of primordial state, it's a chaotic state, which is far from freedom in the sense that would kind of really emancipate you. Um, it's uh, something which is uh, rather chaotic and uh, resembling some kind of uh, original state, which is not actually free. So, and but then he also realized, and Lacan emphasized this very strongly, how there is a certain interplay between, let's say, some kind of a impossibility or some kind of impasse, some kind of contradiction that is there in this uh, imaginary state before the law or whatever, 
and the the law itself and the, the way the reason why let's say the law and these prohibitions uh, often have such a hold on us and uh, why they kind of have this power to organize the society is precisely because they also give a symbolic form to this impossibility inherent in this chaotic state itself. So it's not simply or one way of putting it is, is that a kind of impossibility is uh, the, the, some kind of impotence, let's say more like a, or frustration, impotence is elevated to the status of symbolic impossibility. So, or to put it well, something that you cannot do in any way, physically, let's say, becomes prohibited. Very often symbolic prohibitions are the prohibitions of the impossible. And this is not just stupid. You know, there is something that changes in the nature of what uh, your frustration or your impasse is when it uh, becomes articulated in the law. So I'm not saying that this justifies all the legal, whatever, prohibitions, but there is something in the structure of the law itself, which is um, also an answer to some, let's say, uh, impasse or difficulty, which is not simply... Uh, so, the, so this is why these dialectics, uh, why sometimes it is actually um, um, liberating to have a certain kind of no, <laughs> Uh, because uh, so, and why then to some extent we often hang on to prohibition rather than you know, so the, the, the freedom kind of only starts there, and how we then uh, tackle with these prohibitions and so on, these kind of symbolic rules. So, uh, the this simple idea that, that there is some kind of uh, authentic, uh, whatever, uh, free and pleasurable. Uh, whatever circuit of desires, which is then brutally interrupted by the law and forces us to repress things, is not that, that there is a complicity, let's say, between the uh, chaotic of drives and the law. Law is not simply on the other side of drives, but also, as Freud said, it fits on the drives. It's kind of uh, so there is a certain circularity uh, in the way in which uh, the two are articulated. So, uh, and uh, this is also why uh, it is for Lacan uh, also, but already for Freud, why it is much too simplistic to say that once, if we just get away uh, from all these prohibitions, we will finally breathe um, uh, freely. Uh, and, uh, you know, okay, this is a well known quote from Karamazo Brothers, the Dostoevsky. Uh, novel that Lacan comments on, and uh, I'm sure you know it, when, when this uh, father says, okay, now God is dead, so God as the source, symbolic locus of prohibition, let's say, God is dead, everything is permitted, everything is allowed, and Lacan says, you see, this is precisely what Freud discovered, that it is the opposite, that this is true. Once God is dead, in the sense of this, uh, then nothing is allowed anymore. And this is how Lacan reads the very, let's say, emergence of all these neurotic disorders that Freud was um, uh, started with. But this does not mean, okay, we should reinvent God and some severe prohibitions. This is not what I'm saying. It's just that to point that the, the dialectics between the two is more complicated, more interesting. And also, uh, if you want to think of freedom in any kind of politically also meaningful way, you need to take both into account. So it's not simply let's get rid of all the laws or let's just uh, have all the laws and forget about anything else. It is precisely their complicity and this kind of um, thing that is interesting. Sorry, this was a very long, uh, and I'm sure I didn't even address half of the question that you uh, asked. No, I think that is... That is so much more and better than, you know, the, what the question asks it actually, you know, you still address it, the, but, uh, you bring up several things I would like to get into, but just to kind of resituate. So the, I guess my clarifying question would be, so you're saying that drive feeds off of law. Yeah. Now the question is, is, is drive 
prior to law? Is the baby is the baby prior to its uh, coming into the the symbolic and language uh, and being tr you know domesticated or trained into society or whatever? Is the baby already a bunch of drives, or or does it already have drive? Yeah, I mean, uh, this question of uh, the chicken and the egg, it's uh, always a tricky one because, I mean, even if you say, okay, obviously babies are, are born with what we observe as certain drives. I mean, something drives them. Uh, but it is true that basically what is at stake here, at least like from what uh, we can see, is that what drives them are some basic needs, which is to say hunger, uh, or whatever other um, uh, displeasures, the things that irritate them, pain, whatever that they. So that, that there are, uh, you could say to put it very simply, that there are some basic needs that drive the baby. To, to, but at the same time, there is also one thing which is uh, which comes into play very very early, which is this relationship to the other, with usually the parents. Uh, and the way in which uh, what you demand from the other, even when you cry for food, uh, becomes attached to something else in this demand, which is, for instance, uh, the demand for love, which very, so it's not, in, uh, you cry for food, the food is given to you, but it is given to you, it could be given to you in many different ways. Ones that you can associate, like if somebody just stuck some whatever, think into your mind and uh, disappears. It's not the same if somebody, you know, answers your demand for food. So th there is uh, there is a point in which this interaction with the other, who is usually also the carrier then of all these prohibitions and whatever limits and uh, uh, things that the law that is uh, being formed, uh, something happens here which is not simply and that, uh, the, the, which also allows for the drives in this more genuinely Freudian Lacanian uh, meaning to appear. Because f drives are not simply needs. Drives are needs who actually already divert, let's say, from their biological aim. This is the basic definition of a drive. Drive is not just drive to food, this is hunger. Uh, drive is precisely, for instance, this is one of Freud's example. Uh, the, the, it could be drive related to to to, to nurture, to, to 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 eating. Could be the drive related to the satisfaction of the mouth, that is a side product of satisfying, appeasing your hunger. You know, so which is why, for instance, sucking on this thing. How is it called in English? That children get. Um, you know, when they are uh, being appeased, they they get how is this called? I don't know. I know. No, I know but... this. I know. I know this one. It's a binky. Yeah, a uh, binky. I mean, this is you know. Here you can see something of the drive, which is not. You do this, you don't get any food, right? But still, there is a satisfaction there, not just because it resembles food. It, but the, so the drive is always, always already something that drives a little bit away from the need, although it appears with the need and then makes a different kind of circuit and uh, kind of makes circle of a different kind of object. So the object of the drive is never simply the object that satisfies the need, but it is real nevertheless. So uh, and so to, to answer your question, it is precisely uh, and this drive then are already drives because they become part of also this symbolic network. Uh, I mentioned, okay, the demand for love, but there are other things where drives can get a f some extension which goes b far beyond, let's say, basic biological needs precisely because there is certain, let's say, symbolic signifying support then it makes this ex uh, extension, this long circuit possible with all this, all at the same time, uh, uh, enabling the satisfaction being produced, another kind, the other, so-called the other satisfaction in this, in this circuit. Uh, so in this sense, uh, drives uh, and 
that the symbolic are kind of chicken and the egg. You can start, you know, it's in some way like Friday from the need, you said, okay, drive start by inhibiting the need, but then they kind of develop a life of their own, which is not reducible back to uh, to just to need to the satisfaction of uh, hunger, thirst, whatever uh, is there, including if you want some kind of sexual urge, which is also something else, I don't know, some kind of um, need to, to get to whatever, which is not the same thing as um, sexual drive, which is, uh, again, uh, something that encompasses a much uh, uh, wider uh, wider sp- sphere. So, yeah, this would be my answer. I hope it clarifies a little bit. But otherwise, you know, this is what I said, that the, the uh, law also fits on the drives. This is particularly true, or this is particularly something that Freud said for the so-called superego law, which is not simply the same thing as some kind of uh, uh, external symbolic prohibition. Uh, but when he came, Freud came um, across this paradox that it was precisely people who led the most saintly life, you know, like almost like saints, who reproached themselves with the, uh, the worst sins and uh, that there is this kind of a, a strange spiral of guilt. Uh, the, the more you obey the law, the more guilty you are. Uh, and the, there is something, the more you give, the more you sacrifice to the law, the more it maltreats. It's not that you give it more and then it will uh, be satisfied with it. Okay, so you did what you, uh, what I asked you to do. No, with the superego, it's the other way around. The more, and this is why it, I say it fits on the drives, because the more of the drive you so-called sacrifice to it, the more this internal law enjoys uh, becomes itself a kind of live enjoyment that might treat you. So because it's not that all enjoyment is pleasurable and not all enjoyment is something that you want. <laughs> you know, the superego is part of you and it enjoys, but you suffer because of this. So the superego enjoying is something that you, you feel to a certain extent, but it, it, it's a kind of suffering. I mean, this is, I guess, the phenomenon of you can also, you can only feel uh, the enjoyment uh, uh, of the superego precisely in this sadistic form in which you kind of treat yourself. But finally, to, if you are talking about superego precisely as something which is the kind of internal instance, which is not, uh, and so you can obey the external laws, but this thing in your head still keeps telling you this is not enough, it is never enough, you didn't do the you know, this kind of internal sensor, who, as Freud puts it, sees also what you can hide um, from the external authority. You can, you know, uh, lie to your parents, and this is no problem. But the moment you internalize this, as long as they don't know, you are okay. uh, But this then precisely um, makes this kind of cheating, let's say, the symbolic other, the law, impossible because you cannot hide it um, um, from yourself. Uh, and so there is something in yourself that makes you uh, pay for it. Amazing. And then I guess with our remaining time, uh, That's can kind, of, time. <laughs> kind of bring it all back together into the idea, the, that question of, of sex and drive. And so this expanded notion of sex. You say it's not just the the act of sex. Um, well, what is the relation then of sex and, and drive in this way we're talking about it? I mean, this is precisely the why, as you pointed out, uh, the way, not only me, but the way I uh, talk about sex, sex for me is a concept that uh, it, um, that names, like conceptually names, a certain configuration, let's say, which is configuration of a negativity, of certain deadlock, of certain death, and a surplus that is organized around it. Because in my theory, in my view, uh, there is uh, the surplus is not simply that you have something, some level, and then you have the surplus. This kind of surplus of drives it only appears at the point of a gap, of uh, 
lack of some uh, something not being there, then there is surplus. And also, I mean, this is uh, like uh, even in kind of imaginary way, there is uh, this can be related to the so-called erogen zones, which are always also zones which are uh, uh, something that surrounds a certain opening, a certain um, soul, so to say. Uh, it be or even eyes, you know, it, there is a certain logic, uh, even bodily logic, but here I'm not talking about this, how there are this surplus of drive, this excess of drive, uh, is not simply excess over some normal limit, but it is excess that appears at the place of something which is not there. Basically, this is what I'm trying to argue all through the book. And so, so but in sometimes being accused of why negativity, this is a possibility. No, the point is precisely that you cannot separate the two. If you want to explain the surplus, the positivity, this kind of thing that um, you cut it here and it re-emerges there, uh, you need to include the precisely this negativity as its in in inherent point, not something separate that you can separate from this positive, let's say, excessive uh, uh, form or appearance of the, of the drives and so on. So, uh, and so sexuality for me is precisely sex in the sense if you just, it's not simply about sexual act, uh, which obviously exists, but sexuality, the, the concept of sexuality in psychoanalysis is a concept of something which has no uh, substance in the sense that there is this sex, you can neatly circumscribe the thing and say, okay, this is now uh, uh, sex and then the, the rest is something else. No, the problem is that there is something, some, some nothing, something which then only exists through these all kinds of extensions, including, of course, obviously, sexual acts and many other stuff, including sublimation that you mentioned before and so on. So there is there's a network that is uh, growing out of this thing, which is not a thing precisely. It is a, another kind of culture, but it's not that there is some uh, core sexual, sexual core and then these things are growing out of it. No, the sexual core is precisely uh, a certain negativity that nevertheless organizes or is the root, let's say, of all these pussy, of all these extensions, which then can just become loose ends and have no particular whatever way of coexisting or can form something more uh, solidified, let's say, in a sense. But so the, the sexuality and the drives are very much uh, connected precisely through this concept of negativity that exists as surplus of something and only as such, not that you can encounter the negativity d directly, you know, in it, but precisely uh, when you start to think like ontologically or, uh, about uh, this uh, organization. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, this perhaps is, uh, sounds a bit complicated, but I think it also rhymes with our very fundamental experiences of sexuality, which is uh, everywhere and nowhere in the sense of uh, everywhere, but it's not that you can just uh, very neatly uh, circumscribe it and say, okay, the, up to this point this is sexual and from this point on it's not. I mean, this is already involves some kind of repression, not of sexuality, but of thinking of this impasse, because I think what is really, really crucial and what happened in most of the American, let's say, uh, reception of Freud and in psychology, is not to be, they talk about the repression, but actually they repress the repression itself. It becomes something very different from repression. But anyway, I will, I will stop sharing. <laughs> uh, so then it would be a mistake to say that they are the same thing. They're connected. Through ne through negativity, but they're not the same thing. No, I mean to to some extent you can say that, that there is um, there is no. Let, let me put it like this. Uh, according, this is Lacan saying there is no such thing. I think already Freud. There is no such thing as sexual drive in the sense of you know instinct that just. Uh, but at the same time, sexuality is precisely this kind of compound of drives. Uh, or the 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 thing that precise the thinking drives that refers to uh, what is there in drives, uh, more or other 
than the satisfaction of this or that immediate need. So you can say that sexuality or sex is the name precisely of this space, let's say, that opens between the satisfaction of the need and something else that gets satisfied uh, in through other ways. But this is precisely why then it becomes uh, why we can say, like, you know, Lacan says that, okay, I, I'm talking now here or reading this book, but I can be, uh, it could be not a sexual experience in the sense that equivalent of the sexual act, but there is something going on there which is about a certain satisfaction, uh, which is in itself paradoxical, and in this sense also sexual, that it's not simply because I want to, I read because I want to learn this or that. Uh, I also read it sometimes for some pleasure, but also because something drives me in this in, in this reading. So the point is not, you know, that everything, all these activities that are not directly sexual are at the bottom sexual and thus dirty. You know, this is one understanding of the psychoanalysis wants to reduce everything to sex and says, okay, there is sex behind uh, you read the book, you just sublimate, sub, uh, sublimate whatever the uh, sexual desire you cannot satisfy in another way. No, the point and uh, it, uh, the revolution of Freud, well, and this is what was the scandal that his theory really produced, was uh, not to abase these intellectual activities to something lower like sex, but actually to, to show how sexuality itself is a highly intellectual activity. Uh, it, it, it is already there. I mean, it is not simply, uh, you know, two bo- the, there are two boys, but the, something happens there, which is precisely, which goes beyond this kind of, you know, whatever you would uh, call it, uh, um, um, biological, anatomical, or whatever kind of dysfunction. So, and I think here uh, Lacan was quite right in pointing this out, that the, the real scandal of Freud was uh, not that whatever high philosophy is uh, the basis has to do with sex, but that sex has to do with high philosophy. And this is not exactly the same uh, the same claim. Thank you so much. I think we'll have to close it out here because of the time. I would love to get into how that creates serious problems for doing ontology, for doing epistemology, how it brings so much light to uh, ethics. And uh, you even raised things that I would like to get into about um, the, you know, well, you know, you can't just bring God back. There's not just a solution by bringing God back. There's so many questions that I would love to delve into, but, you know, I'm sorry to say we're out of time. So thank you so much for joining. It's been an absolute delight and an honor that you have spent this time with us you for inviting me and I'm sure there would be some possibility or chance to continue these discussions with the questions that you mentioned and perhaps some others. So thank you. And thank you so thank much. You everybody. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. All right, everybody, whether you watched and or listened to this on YouTube or listened to this via podcast, I just wanted to say thank you for making it to the end. I hope you found this worthwhile. If you got distracted along the way, tuned in and out, no worries. At least now you kind of have a sense for the territory and what it's good for and whether or not it's worth coming back to in the future, which is ultimately what it's all about. And so just wanted to make a couple quick plugs here as far as uh, ways that you can get involved at Theory Underground. So the main thing is, is that we have weekly events and we have monthly events and then we have special courses. Now the special courses are like usually a one-off thing, right? It might be a short course, it might be a long course. Courses might include things like Mikey teaching Slavoj Zizek for they don't know what they do, or Leon Brenner teaching clinical structures and autism and psychoanalysis, or me teaching being in time or totality and infinity. But I think one of the coolest ways to get involved uh, if you don't have the time and or money for a full-on course right now 
is to check out the ongoing seminars. There are two that take place. One is on the second Sunday of every month. The other is on the fourth Sunday of every month. And then there's a sort of floating discussion that changes uh, whether it's the first or the third or sometimes the fifth Sunday of a month. That's kind of just agreed upon depending on my availability and my wife's availability. So the two of us do these lecture sessions for critical media theory and critical doxology and time energy. Those two ongoing seminars are part of research cohorts for people who want to do writing on these topics or people who might want to use a critical media theory or critical doxology and time energy theory for their own projects. And so this is like a way to get a basis in these fields, but it's also a way to kind of get to know people who are really working on the main research threads here at Theory Underground. Subscribers also get access to the weekly events, which are Capital Mondays every Monday, variable times for that. Just if you are interested and you sign up as a subscriber, just reach out to me and I'll add you to that list. And then we also do these multilingualism immersion sessions where we on Wednesday do Club Espanol at 3 p.m. Eastern time. On Thursdays at 10 a.m. Eastern time, we are joined by Terrence Blake. And if you haven't watched the interview that we did with him, you got to check it out. He's a really cool guy. He's been speaking French and writing it and doing theory in French, studying under people like Deleuze and Foucault back in the day. And now here he is teaching us all French. So definitely check that out. And then Solitariat is health and fitness. This is where we just do a check-in. It's a quick 40 minute in and out. Once per week, we just talk about like what kinds of physical activities have we been doing? What kinds of diet choices are we making? And what's something we're going to try to do different this week? Like that kind of check-in. It's, it's almost like, I feel like it's like a sort of secular confessional, but it does help me kind of stay on top of my game. It often inspires me to go on an extra run or go hit the gym, whatever, you know, stuff like that. Stuff that thinkers need, right? American thinkers need multilingualism immersion. American thinkers need health and fitness because it's too easy for us to get just stuck in the reading and the writing and the scrolling on the phones and all of that kind of stuff, especially when we don't have the time energy, especially when we're constantly busy. It, having some kind of a structure, accountability, some kind of a check-in, that really helps me. And that's why it's ultimately here because I find it useful. Nance finds it useful. A handful of other people find it useful. And so if you want in, this is a great way to get to know us. But also every month we have other events that are just like these monthly events. These are just a few of the things that we're currently doing. There's a lot more coming. Right now the app and the website are buggy and beta. And so don't trust them at all. Uh, the best way to know what's going on is to become a subscriber. Hit me up. Like, Let me know what you're most interested in. And uh, we'll go from there. I guess the last thing I want to say is big thank you to my patrons over at Patreon. So the difference between a subscriber and a patron is the subscriber is giving me anywhere between 30 and $300 a month so that they can be involved in all of these activities. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. If you don't care so much about the theory courses or the ongoing seminars or the multilingualism immersion events or the health and fitness or the film club stuff, if that none of that really matters to you, but you want to support, then the best way to do that is to become a patron. And so thank you. Big, big thank you to Nico and Sakil and Zoxandra and Darian Large. You're really helping make a difference here because as of uh, two weeks ago, I started skipping work at Amazon. <laughs> thank you. It really means the world to me that people are supporting me on Patreon, that people are monthly subscribers, that people maybe just want a one-off course, but ultimately you're all the best. And if you're kind of like, hey, I can't do any of that stuff and I'm broke, motherfucker. Well, don't worry, there is a scholarship if you want to get involved. But if you don't and you just like the content, then hit the like button, comment, let me know what you think about something that happened. What was your favorite quote from the whole live stream? What was something that somebody said that you thought was a great moment? Maybe timestamp it. I love that stuff. But if you're on the podcast, make sure to review the Theory Underground podcast. Thank you, everybody. Take care. All right. I know this is like already the longest PSA in the world, but there's a lot of stuff going on at Theory Underground. I just wanted to make this quick insertion to also remind you that there is the Theory Underground European tour happening between April 27th and 
May 25th. The dates and locations are almost secured and you, you can see them right here on the whiteboard, as well as the October conference happening in Boise. It's going to happen between the 24th and 26th. And uh, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you can check out the call for proposals on that should be up on the channel now. All right. Now, you know, everything. Thanks.